So I want to ask you a question this morning, and it's a question that we need to ask ourselves uh, every day. What is it, Pastor? What's so great about grace? Well, what's so great about grace? You hear people talk all the time about grace, grace that, grace this, grace But what's so great about grace? You know, Pastor, you don't understand what my week looked like. It was terrible. Well, I want to know where the grace is when I need it. I want to talk about that this morning. I want to talk to you about something that I think is so amazing. I mean, last week we talked about worship, and I gave you this, this I think, great example in the life of a woman who worshiped Jesus by literally pouring perfume on him and by cleaning his feet with her, with her tears and her hair. But this morning, I'd like for us to consider another topic that I really love to preach about because it is the good news that the world needs to hear about, right? Uh, I, I, I mean, partly th- this thing, uh, grace, is, is part, you know, we talk about, we think it's so great because, because that's what causes or allows us to be saved by grace that you're saved, uh, by faith. Not through your works, but, but, but so no one can boast, right? And so we, don't, we know about that part of grace, but what about the other part of grace? The part about grace that takes you from where you were to what God sees you as being. How many of you know that God doesn't see you as being the sinner that you were before you came to him? God doesn't see you like that. He doesn't want to see you there. In fact, you don't want to be there. Because that's why he came to God in the first place. So we're going to talk about this morning the idea of how great grace is from a couple of different avenues. Uh, Paul talked about it in Ephesians. I just said that verse, by by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself, the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. That's the salvation part of grace. Uh, Most most people would agree that it takes grace uh, to get you saved. If you don't agree with that, well then uh, unfortunately you're incorrect. Um, not because I said so, because the Bible said so. But also in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. So whatever you are at this point right now, if, you, if you're better than what you were before you got saved, it's because of the grace of God. It's a good time to say amen. Because you weren't good enough to get saved. It took grace to get you saved. And I'll tell you something else. It takes grace to keep you saved as well. Anybody agree with that? And because, you know, you think, gosh, I remember what I looked like pre-salvation. I remember what I looked like before I had Christ in my my life. Think about just for a second who you were and what you were before the grace of God allowed you to be a child of God. You think about that for a moment, and then you think, oh, wow, wow. I mean, I'm not all that I need to be, but I'm not what I used to be, and glory to God for that. Does anybody agree with that? Are you with me this morning? I know you went to VBS this week. Uh, one of the best ones we've ever had. I loved it. I'll talk about that in a minute. But has God ever done anything through you that felt really good? I mean, it amazes me. uh, it, It amazed me this year. It always amazes me to see how great our VBS is. This year we had record attendances. We ran in the 80s, just kids. I mean, used to, we would think if we had 50 people, if we had 40 people, including the adults, we thought it was a good year. I mean, we had to beg for enough workers to get the thing done, and now they're coming out of the wood work. And we're, glory to God for that. And I'll tell you something else, we had six of those young people that accepted Christ as their Savior. You think the effort wasn't worth it? Amen? I mean, Friday night, our workers put together the inside of the belly of a whale. I mean, you had these, these, these bones, these, these inside. I mean, it was amazing. And those kids went in there, and they heard about the life of Jonah. And then they came out, and they heard a uh, Bible hotline. <laughs> I had this big old cell phone up here, and every night, Bible hotline would call. And there was this weird kind of connection between Brother Mark and Brother Tyler all night long, every, every night. Bible hotline speaking. <laughs> the kids ate it up. Can anybody, can, does anybody still have that tune? Everybody go, yeah, 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 yes, to va, 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 VBS. I mean, is that going through your mind so much that you can't get it out of there? Right? Why? Because of the grace of God inside of us, we want to do something back for him. We want to share the good news to people who don't know it. We want to do something. It keeps coming out of us, and we're looking for ways to show God's grace to other people. If that's not you, why not? If that's not you, why not? Well, that, that's 1 Corinthians 15. There's another story that we're going to really dive into uh, tonight. It's in the book of Romans chapter 4. And uh, Paul tells us a story 
um, about Abraham, and he's a character we find in the Old Testament. In fact, we're first introduced to him back in Genesis chapter 12. He's kind of the father of our faith. He's the one that everybody looks up to, but we're going to find out that he had a few chinks in his armor as well. So everybody turn with me now to Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, if you don't have a, the NIV version, you have a hard time following along, just look at it on the screens. My good folks there uh, in the tech department will help us out with that. Romans chapter 4, verse 1, let's read it together. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? And this is matter of grace that they're talking about. If in fact Abraham was justified, justified means made right, if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Here it is. This is our focal verse, so we're going to get back to it here in a bit. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, let's read the rest of the passage so you kind of get a connection here. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation, right? Now, when you go to work during the week uh, and you get a paycheck, that paycheck is not a gift. That paycheck is what you are owed because you did work. Is everybody with me on that? Okay. Um, but, but in this particular um, context here, Paul's referring to people who think they can earn their salvation by their works. That's a prevalent idea right now. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jews of the time thought that they had to work their way into a relationship with God. Paul is, uh, Paul is talking about uh, doing away or debunking that theory. So, okay, so it says, uh, verse 4, Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as gift, but an obligation. That, verse uh, 5, However, to the man who does not work. Now listen, this is not talking about physical work. This is talking about people who think, who, who, who don't do the work, who don't think I've got to do enough work. So this is the, the connection between the two. It's a connection between people who think they can work for their salvation and people who don't think they can work for their salvation or just don't, right? And, that, and that's us, right? So, but then it says, however, to the man who does not work, but... The man who does not work, but to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith, his faith, not his works, his faith is credited as righteousness. And the simple explanation of this is something we already know, most of us do. Salvation comes by faith, not by works. And that really is that whole idea of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for it's by grace that you've been saved through faith, Right? And so, so that's what we're talking about today is grace. Fathers, we unpackaged this uh, this morning. I pray that you give us special insight because, Lord, I think some of these words that we hear so much of, we seem to, to sweep under the rug a little bit. We, 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 we seem, to, under, we, we seem to, to misunderstand how important that they are. So, Lord, as we speak about this this morning, I pray that you'd receive glory and honor and praise, Lord, because it is a privilege to be called a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So this week I, I, was, I was texting Cheryl, um, which I, I um, you know, we've been, we've been married like 70 years now, and, um, and, and, it, and, it, and she's, she's kind of wore out with me, I guess, a little bit, but I still love her. And um, so I wrote her this, a text this week, and I said, I am so glad that I am married to you. And everybody here would say amen, right? And, and so, I, you know, there was just, there's just times, I think, that you need to tell your spouse, look, I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm glad that we're married. I love my, my, you guys have said this, so don't, just don't judge my dad too bad. But my dad said, hey, listen, I he talked to, his, to, to my mother, his wife. He said, I told you that I loved you when we got married. If it changes, I'll let you know. My father failed the ID10T test. Y'all figure that out. ID10T, ID10T, the idiot test. No, I'm just, 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 just kidding. Something about relationships 
that are ongoing relationships, we seem to think that we have arrived and we no longer have to work at those relationships. Marriage is one of those. I got to do some marital counseling with my daughter and, and my future son-in-law this week, and we went through these wonderful things that, that will help you communicate and all that. And, and, and one of the things I told them was that marriage is a journey. It is not a destination. It's something to be worked on and nourished and appreciated because I'll tell you this. I, said, I don't know. I don't know if you'll like this or not. I heard it somewhere, and I've always remembered it. If you don't love your wife, somebody else will. Kind of sounds bad, but it's kind of true. And that's the way it is with our relationship with, with, with God. It, God. Our relationship with God is so amazing and so great and so wonderful. Why? But yet, it seems like sometimes we take it for granted. Okay, well, I understand how great grace is. Now let's move on to something else. No, I don't think you do. I'm on this, oh, I'm on this diet. It's called, it's called the H-E-L-L diet. Y'all will get that in a minute. Anything that's, that's good to eat is not on the diet. Anything that's not good to die, to, that, that's not good to eat is what you have to eat. Y'all know where I'm at? Y'all been on that diet before? Me too. And so, so, but my little bride, she, she, she feels so bad for me. And so this week, she figured out how to put stuff on the plate that was good for me, that was on the diet, and that I could eat. And dude, I ate it up and gained a pound and a half. <laughs> really? That's just how it works, right? But let me ask you this. What's so good about grace and why do we need it? If you go to the mall or go to Walmart, where people hang out, and you ask somebody the question, what do you have to do to get to heaven? You'd get a variety of, of, of answers to that question. But, but most of them would be something like, well, you need to be a good person or you need to be a person that does more good than bad. Can I tell you the problem with that? <laughs> First of all, we have different levels of what people think are good. But secondly, and the most importantly, Psalms chapter 14, verse 3, there's, the Bible says there's no good. No one good, not, not even one. Not, not even one. So let me explain something to you. We live in a world right now where everyone gets a trophy for showing up. It's called a participation trophy. And everybody gets the same trophy, whether they're the best or they're the worst. And can I tell you, that is counter-scriptural. I mean, I'm okay if your kid goes and plays soccer and gets a trophy. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is for us to think that just because we were born that we deserve to go to heaven. It doesn't work that way. How many of you know it doesn't work that way? Yeah. You know, if God's standard were good, then a lot of you would make it. I wouldn't, but a lot of you would make it if God's standard was good. Cheryl would be there. Y'all would be there. I'd be, I'd be left behind. So would you, William. So I, I'm just telling you, we'd be left behind. But God's standard, I'm just kidding, but God's standard is not good. God's standard is perfection. Now, why would a God that knows that we're not perfect and can't match perfection and can't do perfection, why in the world would he make perfection the goal and the standard? Why? Because he knew that if the standard was perfection and you couldn't, you couldn't live up to that level, then you would need a Savior. That's what grace is about. That's what grace is about. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. So even if, you know, how many of you in here have broken every single law in the Word of God? Every single law in the Word, every single rule. How many of you have looked through Scripture and have broken them all? No, you have not. No, you have not. No, you have not. Yeah, who'd y'all murder? So you hadn't broken them all, most of you. <laughs> most of you. <laughs> most of you. Okay. So if you've broken them all, or if you've broken only one of them, you're in the same boat. <laughs> you're in the same boat. You're in the same, listen, I don't care how many times you've sinned, maybe I've sinned more, maybe I've sinned less, it doesn't really matter. We're on the same boat, and it's going down a fast path to a place called hell. That's right, you heard it here. But, <laughs> but, here's what's so amazing. Kevin, Kevin Malloy told me about a, a little kid that was, was in vacation Bible school this week, doesn't go to church, parents didn't go to church, but, he was, but, he, but they brought him. 
and he heard about God's Word, and he comes out of a class, and he was telling Kevin, hey, I've never really read the Bible before. In fact, I didn't really know much about it, but that thing's pretty cool. <laughs> I went, yeah. All of a sudden, I'm not so tired on Friday night of VBS. All of a sudden, I'm not so worn out. All of a sudden, that week of vacation Bible school, when those kids get on your last nerve, all of a sudden, it's worth it. Because that child who doesn't get to hear what you hear every Sunday, got to hear about the grace of God. And you know what? On Thursday night, that same kid prayed and received Christ. Yeah. Woo! How about that? Somebody clap, all right? You know, anybody that's, here to, anybody that's not here today didn't get to hear that, so, so look it up online, uh, lakeviewnwa.com under the media tab, Amen. So, so we're going to pull this verse that I told you about earlier. It's our, it's our key verse here out of Romans chapter 4. So look at it with me. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Abraham believed God, that's one, and it was credited to him, that's two, as righteousness. That's going to be our three points, but I'm going to, turn, I'm going to, I'm going to flip them over because I think we need to understand the end before we'll understand the beginning. So that, there's what we're going to do. So three, three points. First of all, the end of the verse says as righteousness. So what is righteousness? What, what, if righteousness is such a big deal, and if, if righteousness is what we want, then what is a definition of righteousness, okay? So, so, so the, uh, the Bible dictionary that I have online or, or in my computer says that righteousness means right standing with God. It means your actions conform to what God would have you to be, okay? So that's what it means. So here's what we need to understand. We are, listen, listen close. This is, this is so good, but if you miss it, you, you'll miss the whole thing. We are not um, in right standing with God because we do right things. We're not right in, in right standing with God because we do right things. Because I can't do enough right things. In fact, I do a lot of wrong things that kind of circumvent the, the good things that I do. Um, I'm in right standing with God not because of the things I do, but because of the thing that Jesus did. That, that's That's grace. And because Jesus did the right thing and does the right things, what causes me to be righteous is that I believe in him. And that grace that passes all understanding comes into my life. And then I'm in right standing with God. So let me put it another way. <laughs> it's another one that will twist and turn here. I, I changed it a couple of times last night, but it's still going to be hard for you to understand if you don't listen, okay? Can an unrighteous man, person, can an unrighteous person do righteous things? Yes. Okay, yes he can. Now, does the righteous things that the unrighteous man does make him righteous? No. It's like, it's like if I take a glass of water and I put some, some dirt in that water, and then I put some more clean water in with the dirty water. Does the clean water make the dirty water clean again? No. Thank you. You're listening. Ali, I get it. Okay? So, now this is where we miss it some. Can a righteous man do unrighteous things? <laughs> we do them, don't we? Right? So does the unrighteous things that a righteous man did make him unrighteous? You're getting it, aren't you? You're, get, you're getting it. Why? B because it doesn't, it's, it's not the way it works. It, your salvation is not about your works, and keeping your salvation is not about your good works or your bad works. You don't, you don't work to get your salvation. You don't work to keep your salvation. You work because of your salvation. Woo! There's a whole different thing, right? Why, why do you give of your time? Why do you give of your money? Why do you give of, of yourself? Why do, you, why, do you, why do you spend time reading? Why do you get up early on Sunday mornings and come to church? Why? Because of the grace of God that's in you, you want to be different than what you were. I don't like that person. I don't want to go back to that person. Because of the grace of God, I'm no longer that person. Whew. That's where it gets good, right? That's what righteousness is. 
I mean, God's not saying he's pleased when you do sin. And he's not saying that there's going to be some punishment when you sin. But he's saying that, that's, that, that, that that unrighteous thing you do is not going to make you um, unrighteous in the eyes of God. And that's good. And that's grace. Here's a question. Here's another question. Here's the second part of that verse. Did Abraham earn the grace? Verse 2. Romans chapter 4, verse 2. If, in fact... Abraham was justified by works. In other words, if he earned it, he had something to boast about, but not for God. You know, when God does something awesome in your life, you know, if I walk to the back back there and, and you say, boy, Johnny, that was an awesome sermon. I wish you would so you can hear my response. Because I'll promise you this, if if it was good, it's because God made it good. If it was not good, it was because I didn't listen to God to make it good. Because I am not that. I, I'm, I'm an old um, preacher, grew up in a little town just like this one, got nothing special about me. But can I tell you this? When God came into my heart, he made me special. And he made you special. The day that he came in to your heart you know when i get to when, when we get to heaven you know no, nobody's gonna walk up to you in heaven and say hey you know why i'm here because of me <laughs> i'm good man i'm the best thing you ever seen you know god when i got when i got to heaven god got up off his throne and walked the pearly gates and shook my hand because i am such a good person nobody's gonna say that not one single person you know not you know i'll tell you something else no nobody in heaven is gonna say somebody turn the lights on <laughs> Why? Because Jesus is the light. Can I tell you what? When you get to heaven, you think about grace here and how good it is. You get to heaven, grace is just going to be plastered on every wall because Jesus is going to be everywhere, right? No, people in heaven are going to say, I'm here because of the blood of Jesus, because of the grace of God. That's what they're going to say. Romans 5, 17 says this, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, that's about Satan, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through that one man, Jesus Christ? Let's give him a little hand. Is that all right? <laughs> Listen, it's a gift. It's not earned. Romans chapter 4, verse 4 says, Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. And this verse is saying that if Abraham had performed enough works to earn his righteousness, then God would have, earned, God would have owed it to him. Hey, God, you remember when I did all those good works? You remember when I helped that person? You remember when I did this? You remember when I did this? You owe me salvation. No, it doesn't. God says back to us, well, who created the heavens and the earth? I mean, <laughs> go to the end of Job. And talk to and 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 read the end, the last chapter of Job, and then come back and talk to me about trying to match wits with God, about how, trying to match lives with God. Read the end of Job, and then come back, and we'll talk about it. Right? Listen, God doesn't owe us anything. In fact, what we've earned is eternal life in a place called hell. But because of the wonderful grace of God, instead we have a place in heaven. A lot of y'all know Brother Pat Robinson. He was a former pastor here, came before I did. Great man. And um, this week, I don't know if you've seen on TV, but this week, Aaron Robinson, his grandson, they found him in his bunk, uh, passed away. He was dead. And so that funeral is this week. In fact, I think it's Thursday. And, um, you know, one of the things that Aaron's mother said in the midst of her grief, in the midst of her grief, Television reporter, camera on her, and Miss Wendy Robinson, she said, I'll get to go to the place where my son is. In the middle of your worst time, there's a little bit of light. Why? Because of grace. The word credited is an accounting term. You know, credits and debits, I don't know a lot about that, but, but I do know about accounting a little bit. But God put righteousness 
into Abraham's account because he believed. I mean, if Jesus looks at my account, how am I going to get to heaven? If he looks at my account, all he's going to see is a bunch of sin and a few good works. But he's going to see we're way back in time at a revival service back in the 70s at Wooster Baptist Church. In fact, it was July 4th, 1974 in, in Wooster Baptist Church. We'd just come in from camping. I decided I'd go to church to see the girls. Amen? But when I got there, I didn't get the girls, but I did get Jesus. Because... Of grace. Now, when I went down to that altar, back then we had we had altars, we had real altars. It was like a it was like a bench that was covered up with with carpet and all that. I think it was kind of pink looking carpet. It was the ugliest carpet you ever seen. Why do churches always have ugly carpet except for us? So we got down there on that bench, and Jimmy Terrell, my youth minister, was down there, and I got down to that bench and I knelt down on my knees and I said, Jimmy, here's all the things that I've done good for God. Will he save me? I didn't say any of that. I didn't say any of that. I didn't, tell, I didn't tell my youth pastor how good I was. I didn't tell him about all the good things that I'd done. I didn't tell him about all the reasons that God ought to save me. I didn't tell him anything except I'm lost. Brother Jimmy, I walked an aisle back when I was little at a Free Will Baptist Church in Greenbrier. I thought I was saved because I said the right thing, but I didn't feel anything in my heart and my spirit. But I want you to know that I guarantee you right now, all of that meant nothing. I'm lost as a goose. You know what my student pastor told me? He said, won't you pray and receive Christ? Won't you admit that you're a sinner? Won't you ask God for forgiveness and ask him to come into your heart? He'll save you. Can I tell you this? Grace occurred right then at that little ugly altar in that little Baptist church. And you know what happened? What happened? What happened? You know what happened? Grace was, cre- righteousness was credited to my account because I believed in him. Thirdly, we, we know what righteousness is now, right standing with God, and we know that you can't earn it, okay? So, point number three, what did Abraham have to do to receive righteousness? We'll see that in a minute. He had to believe, though, right? Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's verse four, right? So now you look at at, at, uh, uh, the the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 28. The Bible says, then they asked him, him is Jesus. Then they asked Jesus, what what must we do? Watch this. What, what, (laughs) What must we do to do the works God requires? These people are saying, what do I have to do work wise to get salvation? Now they got it. They don't have it, do they? They don't understand. They don't have it at all. How, how, many, how many laws must I fulfill? How many things must I do? Give me a list of things that it does to, to get salvation. I'll go do them. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who has sent. Notice there's a word works in verse 28, and there's a word work in verse 29. What they're talking about is a list of things that I can do, good deeds, whatever, to get saved. And Jesus says, there's only one work necessary. There's only one work, one work necessary to get salvation. And that's to believe in the one that God has sent. You have to believe in the one that was sent. I mean, here's the thing about this story that's so amazing. I think we miss it a lot of times. I mean, many people don't think they can use them because of who they are and what they've been. But I can tell you this about Abraham. Abraham, before, before God, was a heathen. He lived in a heathen nation. And he was part of, he, apparently he didn't know much about God or anything about God. Or what he did know was distorted. I mean, we don't know, but, but I'll tell you this, we don't know a lot about Abraham pre-God, but we know quite a bit about Abraham post-God, after he believed in God, after his name was changed from Abram to Abraham. This guy was perfect. No, no, not perfect, not close to perfect. I mean, think about this. After he believed, I mean, how many times after you believed have you lied about your wife twice and, and, and was going to let her sleep with a king to save his neck? How many times have you done that, guys? How many times have you lied about your wife and allowed her to sleep with a king so that you wouldn't get killed? That's Abraham. That's what he did. How many times have you guys, I mean, here's what he did. After he believed, Abraham slept with his wife's maid or the handmaid and had a child out of wedlock we're going to talk uh, uh, we're going to see that tonight in our in our study 
But can I tell you this? This man that God said to him, your offspring be like the sands of the sea. I will give you a place and it'll be yours. Talk about the promised land. This man that after all of that stomped on the grace of God, God said what? I don't want you anymore? No. Can't use you anymore? No. You're disqualified? No. I want to tell you what he did. God used him. And God loved him. <laughs> and in the 15th chapter of Genesis, God comes to Abraham in a vision. And Abraham is afraid. But God says, don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. To the man that's doing these things and are going to do these things, he said, I'm your reward. Here's what he said, in essence. Abraham, I didn't come to judge you, and I could. I didn't come to condemn you, and I could. I came for one reason, Abraham. I came to bless you, and that's what he's telling you this morning. And Abraham, watch, very simple. Abraham believed. He believed. And that righteousness was credited to him. It was put in his account. It caused him, even though he wasn't a perfect man, it caused him to do perfect things. Listen, I don't know how you were brought up. I, I don't know what your understanding of the scriptures are. But I can tell you this, God's not looking to judge you. And he could. He's not looking to condemn you. And we deserve it. God's looking to do one thing in your life. He wants to bless you. And if you'll believe, then God will take all the sins, all the sin out of your account and put it in Jesus' account. And he'll take the righteousness out of Jesus' account and put it into yours and what's the result grace what's the result you get a place in heaven what's the result you get to be a child of God what's the result you don't have to be who you were you now have the ability and the strength and the power to be the person to be the the child of God that he wants you to be folks I want to tell you that's a good place to be as our praise members come up now I want to tell you that is what's so amazing about grace. Father, I pray to you this morning, Lord, I want you to know that we love you. I want you to know, Lord, that I love you. I want you to know, Lord, that I have nothing when I don't have you. So, Lord, both of our services this morning and the gathering this morning, Lord, I pray with every person standing, heads bowed, eyes closed, Lord, that you would just work in our midst right now. Help us to understand, Lord, how great that grace is and how we need it in our lives. Not just to save us, Lord, but to make us into who you want us to be. Lord, if there's one here this morning that would have the testimony that would say, Lord, I've trampled all over your grace. I've took that grace that you gave me and I've just stomped on it. I pray that whoever that is, Lord, they would make their way up to the altar here and in the gathering uh, center as well, in the gathering room, Lord. I pray they'd make their way to this altar as we sing this song, Lord, as we, as we lift up words to you, Father. I pray that you would hear our humble cry. Lord, I pray that there's one here that doesn't know you as personal Savior this morning, that they would come now, grab one of our prayer partners by the hand, say, listen, I need to be saved. Lord, I pray if there's one here, maybe a family here that needs to join this church, Lord, I pray you just give them the courage to do that right now, Lord. Lord, I pray if there's concern and struggle and problems in lives, Lord, I know there are, that, Lord, they'd make their way to this altar and they would leave them here. So now, Lord, as I pray, pray that your Holy Spirit would move around us, move among us in great power, Lord. Do your work, we pray, O Holy Spirit, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You come now, here and in the gathering room, you come now. Prayer partners are waiting on you. Let's stand together and pray and sing. Let's stand together.